This year, the Mudd Center is very excited to be collaborating with the Center for International Education on a very timely topic, global ethics in the 21st century, challenges and opportunities. Since last January, well before the pandemic hit, the two centers started putting together a schedule that would take a critical look at international affairs and, and would ask whether and how the world order is changing. Once the pandemic hit and literally the nations of the world were forced to, to interact in new and unexpected ways, we saw that our topic had acquired really a terrible new urgency. One commentator in our research said uh, that the world needed to rethink how it works together. And that became kind of our guide to put together this range of speakers about the current international scene, the role of ethics, and what it all means in this new context of the pandemic. And what I find especially intriguing and especially exciting about this year's program is that all of the speakers we've invited come from across the spectrum of the liberal arts and sciences, different walks of life, professionals, practitioners, scholars, and so forth, all of whom will bring different and unique perspectives to the new challenges that lie ahead in the post-pandemic world. It's clear that the ethical compass may have to be reorganized because COVID and many of the events that have ensued as a result have forced us to revisit the way in which we look at cho choices and forces us to confront the fact that no matter how ethically we approach a problem, ultimately it does involve choices, which makes it extraordinarily hard in some cases to decide what's the most ethical decision. Our, our speakers this year are going to bring tremendous variety of points of view and an incredible amount of knowledge and experience to help us tackle the new ethical framework confronting the world. The Mudd Center has a, a great good fortune of, of having a postdoctoral fellow that is very active in the work of the center. And last year and this year, that fellow is, is Jeremy Weissman, who will be teaching a seminar completely related to the theme of our collaboration this year. This topic and the course that I'm teaching related to it, uh, Ethics of International Relations, could not be more timely. Not only because we have a pandemic, which presents us with an urgent global crisis and questions of what we ought to do now, but we have the looming global crisis of climate change on the horizon, which presents similar questions of what ought we to do, the questions of global ethics. And on top of all this, we're in an election year. And few things probably characterize this election uh, or the past election and also the upcoming election more than what kind of nation we are going to be. Are we going to be a cosmopolitan nation that sees ourselves as a player on a world stage? Or are we going to be a more closed off kind of nationalist nation that sees ourselves literally fenced off from the world and going it alone in many ways and in competition with other states around the world? All these different topics we'll be looking at this semester, again, from climate change to human rights, to humanitarian intervention, to just war theory. These are all gonna to be topics we'll be covering in the question of what ought we to do in terms of our role on the global stage. I'm very excited that our keynote speaker will be the Honorable Ruben Brigadie, who is the former Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University and has just been named president of Suwannee University. Under the Obama administration, President Brigadi was the U.S. ambassador to the African Union. So he has an incredible amount of diplomatic experience, academic experience, and he's going to be talking to us about the role of ethics in the U.S. as it as it applies to the larger world. He has been a leading figure in the whole topic of ethics in international relations and made great strides to develop the curriculum of, of the Elliott School at GW in that direction. So on Thursday, September 24th, 
at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. We'll have this uh, inaugural lecture for the speaker series. So we're very excited about that kickoff for our series. And we think it's going to be one of the finest presentations of the entire year. who are joining us live in the Zoom webinar. You should see a control in your Zoom interface labeled Q&A. 
You can use this control to submit typed questions to us, which our hosts and panelists will read out and address. We would ask that you please hold your questions until the designated time at the end of the lecture. Thank you for your understanding. Once again, please sit tight as we'll be getting started in just a moment or two. We just wanna give folks a little bit of time to get into the Zoom webinar. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for your patience. At this time, I would like to turn things over to Professor Brian Murchison, Director of the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics, and Charles S. Rowe, Professor of Law at WNL, who's gonna give the introduction for tonight's guest speaker and topic. Brian, your video is now spotlighted. Please proceed with your intro. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to our keynote address for this academic year. Most of you know that each year, the Mudd Center selects a general theme and builds a speaker series around it. We invite thinkers from a wide range of disciplines and careers and backgrounds. This year, we've collaborated on a series with Washington and Lee's Center for International Education. And it's been a true pleasure for me to work with my colleague, Professor Mark Rush on the series. We decided last December on our theme, Global Ethics, in the 21st century, challenges and opportunities. Of course, we could not have predicted then how relevant and tragically so our general topic would turn out to be. Before I introduce our honored guests, I wanna thank Professor Rush for so generously collaborating on the series. Many thanks go as well to Amy Jarrett and Patrick Sheridan for their outstanding work with us every step of the way. We thank as well Roger Mudd, whose gift and vision of an ethics center at WNL have made possible this program. Mr. Mudd, I hope you're listening tonight. Please know we send our warmest wishes to you. Now to our keynote. I am so pleased to introduce Ambassador Ruben Brigadi, who just this summer became Vice Chancellor and President of the University of the South, Sewanee. Before that position, he had a very distinguished run as Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, where among much else, he promoted the study and practice of ethics in international relations. Before taking up the leadership of the Elliott School in 2015, Ambassador Brigadi served as US Ambassador to the African Union for two years during the Obama administration. In that role, he managed the strategic partnership between the United States and the African Union with an emphasis on democracy and governance, economic growth and development. He also served as permanent representative of the United States to the UN Economic Commission for Africa. He held other positions in the State Department including serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of African Affairs and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. And in that capacity, he supervised U.S. refugee programs in Africa. He managed U.S. humanitarian diplomacy with major international partners, and he oversaw the development of international migration policy. Ambassador Brigadi is a 1995 Distinguished Midshipman graduate of the U.S. Naval Gr Academy. Uh, he also holds an MPhil and a PhD in International Relations from the University of Cambridge, England. Ambassador Brigadi is a member of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a recipient of the Council's International Affairs Fellowship. Well, I could say more, but thank you, Ambassador, for being with us today. Um, we're thrilled to have you 
as our keynote speaker. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It is my great honor to join you virtually at the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics and to be a part of your series, Global Ethics in the 21st Century, Challenges and Opportunities. I regret that the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic prevent me from being with you in person, but I am grateful for the existence of technology that will hopefully allow us to have an enlightening exchange on the topic I will present today. Black Lives Matter, an international moment. On May 25th, 2020, former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin detained George Floyd for allegedly attempting to use a counterfeit $20 bill. Having handcuffed Floyd's hands behind his back, Chauvin placed the full weight of his body onto Floyd's neck. For an agonizing eight minutes and 46 seconds, George Floyd, a grown man of 46 years, gasped for air and called out for his dead mother while Chauvin squeezed the life out of him. The entire interaction was captured on video by a brave bystander. Chauvin's act of banal brutality was not the first instance of police misconduct against African-American citizens. Sadly, the history of such abuse is both long and well-documented. Nor is it the first instance that was caught on video for the entire world to see, examples of which range from the beating of Rodney King by officers of Los Angeles Police Department in 1991 to the slaying of Walter Scott, who was shot in the back by former North Charleston police officer Michael Slager in 2015. Yet, Floyd's slaying by an officer of the law is the first to have sparked a sustained and spontaneous international movement against racial injustice in general and police brutality in particular. The video recording of Floyd's homicide will stand throughout history alongside other pictures, both still and moving, that have laid bare the gap between America's cherished ideals and lived reality. From Bill Connor's attack on dogs and water hoses being unleashed on children protesting segregation in Jim Crow Birmingham, to the anguish of a naked Vietnamese girl running from a napalm attack that burned the clothes off from her body, along with much of her skin. And from a destitute and desperate migrant mother with her two bashful children in California during the Great Depression, to a lifeless migrant father holding his dead daughter on the banks of the Rio Grande River as they attempted to cross illegally into the United States. Such images have often called our beloved country to account, galvanizing action at home and abroad for America to be better. Because we Americans are a people who are bound not by blood, but by a powerful idea that all are created equal. The recurring pricking of our collective conscience is a necessary, if painful, exercise in our continual task of forming a more perfect union. Ethics, or more philosophy, is a system of concepts for defining, determining, and defending what is right and wrong, both for the individual and for society. How do we know and do what is good, both in our personal and collective lives? On the question of race in America, what we know to be good has evolved slowly, painfully, yet dramatically since the first slaves landed at Jamestown in 1619. As the second decade of the 21st century draws to a close, only the most tortured souls in the deepest recesses of the American body politic would disagree with the proposition that everyone, regardless of race or origin, is, as Thomas Jefferson wrote, endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Indeed, this is now such a self-evident proposition that it is hard to accept the fact that for the vast majority of our country's history, 
this powerful profession of the inherent dignity of all humankind lay in direct contrast to polite popular opinion and official government policy toward people of African descent. In 1903, W.E. Dubois and prophetically wrote, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Well into the 21st century, it is a problem that endures. Even if we know what is right in matters of race, it is doing what is right, or to be precise, knowing what to do, that is often the challenge. Philosophers would refer to this as a question of either normative or applied ethics, taking a general meta-ethical principle, such as the inherent dignity of the individual, and giving it practical effect in a broad field of endeavor, such as the law or medicine, or in a particular situation, like the use of force in combat or policing. In evaluating the significance of the Black Lives Matter movement, the meta-ethical assertion of the inherent and equal value of Black people meets a plethora of normative ethical questions around race and society, as well as applied ethical considerations from the conduct of policing to the boundaries of legitimate social protest. Black Lives Matter. It is a simple declarative statement that is at once clear and powerful, yet also complex and explosive. Let us take a moment to dissect the sentence so that we may more closely examine its meaning. Black. In this context, it refers to people of African descent. And while it may be self-evident to whom this appellation applies, the word itself is freighted both with heavy history and contemporary meaning. From the so-called one drop rule, which for the purposes of enforcing Jim Crow apartheid said that any person with any amount of African ancestry was colored and therefore subject to at best second class citizenship. To those who affirmatively assert their African heritage today as an existential statement of identity, no matter how far removed they may be from their ancestors who left the continent either as chattel or by choice. Being black has always been at once both merely descriptive and unavoidably political. Lives, not people, not individuals, not bodies, but lives. It is a pregnant word that implies not only the identification of a person, but the embodiment of their whole being. For lives are not simply a collection of so many inanimate things like pebbles or paper clips. Rather, they are the summation of all that we are, our hopes and dreams, our loves and our fears, our work and our faith, our purpose and our meaning. Matter, to have value and significance, to be worthy of attention or even protection. People and things that matter must be accorded a place of priority in our consciousness. Those that do not matter may be dismissed without consequence. So to say that Black Lives Matter is another way of saying that people of African descent who have hopes and dreams, love and fears, work and faith, purpose and meaning, have value and significance, and that their full being deserves a place of priority in our consciousness, which cannot be dismissed without consequence. If we accept the aforementioned proposition that recognizing the inherent dignity of all humankind is a notion that is so broadly accepted in American society today as to be axiomatic of our collective life, then saying that Black lives matter should be no more controversial than asserting that water is wet or ice is cold. After all, the statement does not say or plausibly assert that Black lives matter more than others, or that only black lives matter. A plain reading or hearing of those words no more suggests these altered meanings than one might reasonably conclude that some water is more wet than others, or that only ice is cold. All statements must be read in context to understand their full meaning. And in 2020, the assertion that black lives matter a statement which should otherwise be unremarkable over half a century since astronauts first walked on the moon, 
is a statement that is explosive precisely because the need to say it aloud or even to shout it from the depths of one's soul is elicited by mounting empirical evidence that it is still not fully true. From disparities in life expectancy to dramatic differences in familial wealth, and from persistent inequities in educational outcomes to ongoing challenges with the criminal justice system. Virtually every socioeconomic indicator in America testifies to the ongoing struggles of African Americans a century and a half after the abolition of slavery and two generations following the end of de jure segregation. While individual agency is always a vital factor in explaining personal success or failure, the widespread and continuing differences in outcomes in virtually every area of life for Black people in America well into the 21st century demand explanation. This is the implication of Black Lives Matter. It is not only a statement, it is also a movement calling for the examination of this problem and agitating for change. Just as the statement is worthy of ethical analysis, so is the movement. Founded in 2013 by three self-described, quote, radical black organizers, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, and Opal Tementi, in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman for the killing of Trayvon Martin, it is a social activist collective meant to give practical effect to the statement, Black Lives Matter, by calling attention to the continued inequities in American society and around the world that are strongly correlated to race and advocating for public policies to correct these entrenched deficiencies. As their mission statement says, quote, Black Lives Matter is an ideological and political intervention in a world where Black lives are systematically and intentionally targeted for demise. It is an affirmation of Black folks' humanity, our contributions to the society, and our resilience in the face of deadly oppression." End quote. It is also a movement that has generated strong opposition. In general, the critiques of the Black Lives Matter movement fall into three categories. The first is the assertion that the movement practices, or at least tolerates, violence against people and property to achieve their aims. The second is that they are inherently exclusionary, both ideologically and racially. And the third is that, at least here in the United States, they are arguably seditious disloyal to the country whose freedoms they enjoy to make such denunciations possible in the first place. Let us examine each of these critiques in order. The first is the assertion, the first is the assertion that Black Lives Matter practices or tolerates violence. The ethical legitimacy of violence as a form of social protest is an old and ongoing debate. Political violence challenges the monopoly of violence by the state which is the embodiment of the social contract that makes collective life possible. In return for guaranteeing the safety and welfare of its citizens, individuals cede a measure of their autonomy to the state, starting with who may legitimately wield violence. Thus, violence as a form of social protest by those who are not authorized to do so is a strike at the very agreement that makes society possible. Further, with regard to the sanctity of life, which is arguably the foundational meta-ethical principle, it would clearly be problematic for a movement that is dedicated to elevating the lives of some people on a matter of principle to be implicated in harming the lives of others as a means of expediency. Yet the facts matter in evaluating this claim and there is no evidence that Black Lives Matter as a movement formally or knowingly tolerates or advocates violence. To be certain, there have been violent actions and actors that have infiltrated some protests and fomented rioting. They should reasonably and rightly be condemned. A mature democracy simply cannot tolerate the democratization of violence for any cause, no matter how righteous, especially when other avenues of effective protest are available. Further, 
a social movement such as Black Lives Matter, whose foundational premise is that their lives have intrinsic value, undermines its cause if it does not clearly and repeatedly denounce actions taken in their name, which threaten or harm the lives of others. To their credit, Black Lives Matter has made such condemnations in the past. Further, as the armed conflict location and event data project shows, 93% of the 7,400 plus Black Lives Matter protests this past summer were nonviolent. Yet the continued presence of violent provocateurs at protests that echo the Black Lives Matter message continues to plague the organization in the eyes of some members of the public. This leads to the second critique, that the Black Lives Matter movement is ideologically exclusionary. This argument suggests that asserting that Black Lives Matter inherently implies that other lives do not matter, or at a minimum, that they do not matter as much as Black lives. Further, if one can build a movement around the specific concerns of Black lives, then why cannot one just as easily say that white lives matter to assert the value of white Americans, or that blue lives matter to elevate the value and sacrifices of law enforcement officers. On the merits, of course, it is every bit as legitimate for any group to make its case to the public and to the government about disparities in treatment, so long as it is done peacefully. Yet the assertion that Black Lives Matter is inherently exclusionary is belied by two things. The first is the argument presented above, that a plain reading of the statement and an understanding of the facts underlying them cannot reasonably be understood to be exclusionary. To tell the world that you are in pain and require attention is not the same as saying that the pain of others is irrelevant and must be ignored. Second, the composition of protesters who represent a broad diversity of races, religions, and ages suggests that the Black Lives Matter movement is not exclusionary. On the contrary, it is evidence that it is broadly inclusive. Nevertheless, social movements that make space for allies and for the conversion of the agnostic or even the opposed have a resilience that improve the likelihood of accomplishing their goals. Inviting others to make common cause with black lives is therefore an essential task for the movement. The final critique of the Black Lives Matter movement is that it is, is, that it is at its core seditious. Critics have labeled it communist and fascist. The love it or leave it argument deployed against Black Lives Matter is that to protest against the government of the United States in general, or to demand redress for the continued flight of African Americans in particular, is inherently un-American. Yet the love it or leave it crowd forget that America was forged in protest. What after all is the Declaration of Independence if not amongst the greatest protest documents in history. And even if one were inclined to question the patriotism of well-known activists like Colin Kaepernick for taking a knee during the national anthem or millions of ordinary citizens for taking to the streets, it would now be difficult to continue to argue that supporters of Black Lives Matter hate America because the killing of George Floyd changed everything. The asphyxiation of Floyd on the streets of Minneapolis by an agent of the state made all the more heinous by the casual cruelty with which it was done over nearly nine minutes shocked the conscience of the country. Finally, those who had been resistant to hearing the cri de coeur of Black America were able to see and understand that something was terribly wrong. Two generations after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. made his I Have a Dream speech, and over a decade after the United States elected Barack Obama as its first Black president, Derek Chauvin's knee pressing mercilessly into George Floyd's neck was a metaphor for the struggles and inequities that continue to plague Black Americans well into the 21st century and America responded. The Commandant of the US Marine Corps, General David Berger, 
ordered all Confederate iconography banned from all Marine Corps installations. Roger Goodell, commissioner of the National Football League and erstwhile adversary of Colin Kaepernick, publicly apologized for ignoring Kaepernick's years of peaceful protests and committed the NFL to doing better on matters of diversity. Every one of the chiefs of America's armed forces committed their services to listening to their colleagues' stories about race and understanding how they could do better at every level of their organizations. As important as these voltfas were, it was the public explosion of outrage both in the United States and around the world that manifested the widespread revulsion at the killing of George Floyd. Ordinary people everywhere were repulsed by the depravity with which a police officer could squeeze the life out of a subdued suspect in broad daylight. The horror transcended boundaries of nationality, of language, of religion, and of color. In reaction, people spontaneously took to the streets from London to Lagos and from Reykjavik to Rome, from Cairo to Copenhagen and from Tokyo to Tunis to denounce the inhumanity evinced by a sworn officer of the law on the streets of the greatest democracy in the world. And with that uprising, Black Lives Matter went global. History will have its judgment on this unprecedented global outpouring of anguish and anger over a routine police stop gone horribly wrong in a Midwestern American city. There are, however, at least two conclusions that can reasonably be drawn now. The first is that the world expects better of America and calls for us to expect better of ourselves. Having held ourselves as an example of equality under the law and respect for human dignity, the proverbial shining city on a hill since the earliest days of our Republic, our admirers and our adversaries around the world critique or condemn us when we fall far short of the mark. The killing of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin was remarkable not only for the cruelty of the act itself, but also for the dark history that it conjured. It was a testimony to the legions of black men and women in America who have been brutalized or killed by police officers or lynch mobs for generations with impunity. And the fact that this killing was captured on an iPhone in 2020 makes a lie of the assertion that America has fully overcome this painful history. It is still very much with us. And to paraphrase Faulkner, the past isn't even past. The evidence is plain for the whole world to see. When Black Lives Matter protests are held in countries like Iceland and Japan, which have negligible Black populations, or in Syria or Afghanistan, who have their own existential challenges, it is because large swaths of humanity recognize a grievous wrong that must be set right. And we would all do well to listen. The second conclusion is that this moment of crisis on race in America is instructive for other countries as well. Though we as Americans tend to be very self-referential, other countries and societies have had their own painful histories with systems of chattel slavery, with colonialism built on ideologies of white supremacy, and with their own endogenous historical inequalities that are tightly bound with questions of heredity. Our long overdue reckoning with race in the United States sparked conversations in Great Britain about statues in places like Bristol that publicly honor men who made their fortune in the transatlantic slave trade. And the continued controversy over the veneration of Cecil Rhodes, whose diamond fortune was brutally extracted from the exploitation of untold numbers of Black Africans in Rhodesia. The Black Lives Matter protests in America gave further impetus to addressing the plight of the Dalit, or so-called untouchables, in India, who occupy the lowest rung in that rigid caste system. Even in Kenya, the killing of George Floyd prompted conversations and protests about the conduct of police towards Kenyan citizens, 
particularly those of minority ethnic groups like Kenyan Somalis. In this instance, the United States is indeed an example to the rest of the world, just not in the way that George Washington or Ronald Reagan intended. It is our failure in this area to live up to our ideals of equality and dignity in America that have caused people in other countries to confront their own injustices related to race and identity. As we confront this pivotal moment in our history, the central question is what do we do with it? We cannot say that we did not recognize this moment and we must summon the collective courage to meet it. The study of ethics is to help us to know and to do what is right. And as the late American author and poetess Maya Angelou said, when you know better, do better. The first thing we must do is to be uncompromising in facing the facts of historical and continued inequities related to race in our society and to follow the truth wherever it may lead. This is work that is potentially uncomfortable and even painful. It requires us to revisit received wisdom, recognizing that such wisdom may have been received when important perspectives or even people were inadvertently or deliberately excluded. Yet understanding the full truth of our history in our present is essential for building a better tomorrow. As the scriptures tell us, the truth shall make you free. The second thing we must do is commit ourselves to having difficult conversations that lead to greater mutual understanding, that produce more light than heat. This is extremely challenging, particularly on matters of race. Our black brothers and sisters reasonably ask, how much more patient and understanding must we be given the centuries of injustice that we and our ancestors have had to endure right up to the present day? Many of our white brothers and sisters lament, how many more times must we apologize for events that happened long before we were born? When will enough be enough? And our brothers and sisters who are native peoples or who are descendants of immigrants from places other than Europe wonder, when will our stories be told? And how do our struggles and triumphs fit in this unfolding American story? It matters how we address and answer these questions, both looking into our past and gazing into our future. The narratives we tell ourselves about who we have been help to provide the frame for understanding who we are today and set the parameters for the conversation of who we strive to be. If we are to keep our republic, as Benjamin Franklin apocryphally suggested, in a time of increasing diversity, as we reckon with our legacy of racism, we must do the hard work of listening to each other with intention and taking action with humility and grace. This is true for us as individuals, as institutions, and as a country. Finally, we must set and insist on the boundaries of legitimate dialogue and debate. The institutions on which our democracy depends are fragile after all, institutions are not independent entities. They are simply the embodiment of a people who agree to live together under a certain set of rules and understandings. When they lose their legitimacy amongst enough of a community, institutions become weakened and vulnerable. Thus, our democracy is ours to preserve and protect, even as we grapple with incredibly challenging issues that must be addressed. There are at least two essential boundaries on which we all must insist. The first is that the threat or use of violence by citizens against each other is completely unacceptable. When we attempt to settle disputes with the toss of a rock or the barrel of a gun, we threaten the very foundations of our democracy. All of us, regardless of our ideological orientation, must condemn all such violence or threats, whatever the source, and we must do so as often as is necessary. The second is that we must demand accountability under the law for those who fall afoul of it, whether they are police officers, 
public officials, average citizens, or career criminals. As Dr. King said, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. Therefore, we must continue to seek justice in order to build an enduring peace. Black Lives Matter is more than a statement. It is even more than a movement. It is a moment of great consequence in our history as a nation. How we choose to address it will help to define us for a generation and will be remembered for decades to come. As a nation that has always strived to perfect our union by hearkening back to the founding ideals of our republic, let us meet this current moment as our ancestors bravely met theirs. And let us rise to the occasion to strengthen an America that is increasingly true to our starting proposition that all are created equal and that proves itself worthy of its place of leadership amongst the nations of the world. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ambassador Brigadier, for a, a stirring and really a tremendously profound opening speech for the MUD CIE uh, series this year. My name is Mark Rush to everybody else. Um, I am director of the Center for International Education, and it's my role tonight to field and invite your questions and field them. Uh, please do submit them to the Q&A function that you can all see on your Zoom screens. Uh, we may not take them in order. I will, if we have a lot of questions, try perhaps to group some of them around common themes just so we can try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, I will take the privilege of the, the mic and ask the first question, if I may. Ambassador, I'm wondering, you know, as you, as you approach the end of your talk, uh, it reminded me of some of the words I had read in a book written long ago by Anthony Lucas uh, called Common Ground about the busing crisis. I'm wondering, do you see, is there, a, is there a common ground perhaps that can unite the Native Americans, African Americans, the whites and so forth, that might enable everybody to move forward so that no one feels like they're left behind moving forward? I do. Um, well, I do anyway. Um, <laughs> um, and I think it has the following elements. The first is we have to clearly and consistently acknowledge our founding and continuing imperfections. So the argument that America is perfect or at least that its imperfections are um, not worth discussing is to dismiss the heritage of large portions of our country, large portions of our fellow citizens whose ancestors fell on the wrong side of that glorious story. And if any history is relevant, then all of it is. Tell it all. That's the first instance. The second, I would argue, is that notwithstanding the foundational flaws in our republic, the founding ideals were right. In fact, they were so right <laughs> that we've continued to refer back to them as a way of correcting the flaws of the people that wrote them, <laughs> right? Um, when you could have Martin Luther King stand on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and quote Thomas Jefferson's words back to him as a way of undermining um, not only the institution, but the foundational premise of white supremacy that was at the heart <laughs> of um, forget the whole country, just pick Monticello, <laughs> right? That's a very powerful thing. And words matter. And the fact that we can continue to refer back to them and they apply to all of us is I think is a great thing. And the third thing that I think we have to acknowledge and to draw a common ground on is to, is to recognize that we are not enemies of each other. Um, amongst my best friends in the world, uh, people I've known for my entire life, who I went to the academy with, who I've served overseas with, are absolutely on the different, on the opposite end of the political spectrum than I am. Um, and yet, 
Um, we love each other as brothers and sisters. Um, we try hard to have these hard conversations, particularly in this current historical moment. Um, and we try constantly to ask the same question you just did. And one of my fears is that both by virtue of how just segregated we are in terms of living, and I don't even just mean by race, I just mean that like there are Democratic counties or Republican counties, there are Republican churches and Democratic churches, right? Um, that we are increasingly having a hard time seeing our fellow citizens as fellow Americans and increasingly as adversaries. There's a t-shirt going around saying, I'd rather be a Russian than a Democrat. Really? Um, or people that, you know, claim that, you know, every Trump supporter is an inherent kind of racist fascist. Um, we, we have, it, it is this sort of demonization that quite frankly, I have seen in a lot of African countries that I've worked on to help sort of find their way out of crisis. And um, given that there is nobody coming to save us as a country, um, we have got to find ways to, from the starting principle, that even if we may have ideological differences that may seem insurmountable, um, there aren't. You know, one of the jobs as a diplomat, when you're trying to trying to convince an interlocutor to see things your way, is that you have to find even the smallest grain of commonality, even like a tiny little spark, on which you can build a tiny little flame, which can then build to a fire, which they can build a bonfire. And we have to find those connections with each other as fellow Americans if we're to survive as a republic. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna draw upon two questions which have a very similar theme. Uh, the first asks, can the BLM mission be achieved in a society centered around capitalism and capitalist ideals? Uh, can capitalist societies borrow from other types of economic and social systems to support the BLM mission? Uh, and the movement that is currently not prevalent in the USA. The parallel question asks then again, how much of the problem we face is about economic redistribution. Uh, changes in attitudes and embracing diversity are necessary. Until economic injustice is adequately addressed, can we really say we're honoring the idea that Black Lives Matter? So that's two questions, separate um, questioners, but they kind of flow together. I'll do my best to answer and if I get it not right, then I invite the questioner to come back to me through the chat function. Um, I'd say a few things. I mean, so first of all, um, as a full disclosure, I would describe myself as someone who absolutely subscribed to the statement that Black Lives Matter. I'm not sure that I would, I would associate myself with the movement. Um, and the reason is that I would not personally describe myself as a radical activist as the three founders of BLM uh, have. Um, I know that there are uh, people within the BLM movement who believe that America is fundamentally irredeemable um, from that, that the, the racism and white supremacy has been baked in the cakes from the foundation um, and that it cannot be salvaged. I categorically reject that view personally. Um, and so the, the, so the question of whether or not um, BLM can achieve its objectives uh, absent a discussion of um, economic arrangements, or to be more specific, whether or not it can be achieved in the context of capitalism. I'd say yes and no uh, in, the, in the following sense. Um, you know, towards the end of his life, Dr. King began to see that the, the issue of race in America was not merely a matter of access to the ballot box to the vote. It was also a matter of economic justice. In fact, the reason he went to Memphis in April of 1968 um, was to um, support uh, uh, the sanitation workers who were being uh, paid unfairly uh, relative to their white workers. In fact, one of them, I think a couple of them actually sort of been you know, killed in the back of a trash compactor. And just before that, he had been up in Chicago, I think the previous year on a, um, essentially to live in the slums on the South side to draw attention to the economic injustices there. And so to the extent that black people have purposefully been excluded from economic opportunity over time, and the record is brutally clear, everything from 
the extraction of their free labor for two and a half centuries, uh, which helped to build the wealth of America, to the um, destruction of black neighborhoods like Tulsa, um, like the Tulsa was what the Tulsa race riots were. Um, that interesting. Here's a fun fact: the first use of an aerial dropped weapon in anger in the United States of America was not Pearl Harbor in 1941. It was in Tulsa at Black Wall Street in 1929, which balls of turpentine were dropped from the air by crop dusters to uh, destroy uh, that portion of the city. To redlining practices, which lock um, African-Americans into, uh, to, into areas of lower socioeconomic value, to the taking of uh, black farms um, uh, during Jim Crow. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on, and on right? Um, there is a reason why the average, average uh, wealth of a black family in the United States is one tenth the wealth of an average white family controlling for everything else, <laughs> controlling for education, controlling for um, uh, age, controlling for status, controlling for geography, et cetera. And so, no, I mean, on the one hand, and because uh, access to wealth means, and I don't, and I don't mean like, Kim Kardashian wealth. I mean the kind of wealth that means that like you're not going to um, you know, lose your house if your car breaks down because you got to figure out whether or not you're going to pay the light bill or the car bill in order to get to your job. Um, or say that you don't have the kind of wealth to pass on your family farm to your next generation because you had a farm, but it was taken like whatever, hundred years ago, all those sorts of things, right? Um, they provide cushions and kind of not only sort of financial, but social capital that allows families to, um, uh, to weather crises. So yes, absolutely, it's a question. Um, that said, it is also true um, that black people in America are collectively the wealthiest black people in the world when you take a look at how so many have succeeded, not only sort of obvious um, millionaires and billionaires from uh, Robert Smith to Jay-Z and Beyonce, uh, but to the growing uh, black middle class uh, in this country. The question is how do we ensure through public policies that in which, for example, education is not simply tied to property taxes and therefore people in lower, um, um, socioeconomic zip codes by definition have poor um, uh, schools, which therefore leads to poor socioeconomic outcomes, which therefore leads to the poor uh, income potential, all that sort of stuff. And also, by the way, uh, less life expectancy and poor health outcomes. These are matters of public policy that, is, that are entirely within our will to change if we chose. And capitalism even the Chinese communists don't believe in communism anymore, right? Um, there's not a communist, for all the flirtation of African governments after, uh, after colonialism during World War II with socialism and communism, there's not a legit socialist uh, uh, government on the entire continent because everybody recognizes that capitalism is the best way to lift large uh, groups of people out of poverty. The question is a, is a distributive one. And that's not one that is inherently anti-capitalist. That's a question of public policy as a general proposition. Even Adam Smith knew that the invisible hand cannot be allowed to go unchecked. He was a Presbyterian and had a faith system and understood that left to its own devices, the fully free market would inevitably lead to, to concentrations of wealth and greed which is why even he argued that there have to be some, some although we left it to, um, uh, to be determined what those would be, some level of constraints on that activity. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I'll probably talk longer than I should have. So there we go. Thank you very much. Um, question for student. Does the decentralized nature of BLM, which seems to have resulted in various interpretations and confusion over the meaning of defund the police and so forth, does this hinder the ability of BLM to catalyze legislative change? Yes, I think so. Um, for precisely that reason, right? I mean, I think that um, um, the, 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 the various ways in which the statement and the movement have been interpreted um, by various actors for their own purposes um, has allowed those who would be opposed to some degree or another 
um, to point to the most extreme aspect of those who consider themselves adherents and say that's what the whole movement is and, and you don't want that. For example, I absolutely do not agree with defunding the police. Absolutely not. It is essential for a um, for a well-functioning society to have a well-functioning uh, police force and judicial system. Now, that said, broadly speaking, does American policing need reform? Absolutely. For the record, because I know this is being recorded, this uh, session is being conducted the day after a grand jury in Louisville, Kentucky decided that no police officer is legally accountable for shooting Brianna Taylor dead in her own house while she slept on a no-knock warrant that was executed at the wrong address in the first place. Now, one might plausibly argue, clearly as the Kentucky Attorney General did, that the law necessitated that particular outcome. But I would ask the, <laughs> the meta question, because adherence to the law is not the same thing as the arrival of justice. And what kind of system do we have that would allow a woman to be killed by agents of the state as she slept in her own bed peacefully, harming nobody, and for there no one, and for there to be no one to be held accountable? And further, you can't imagine that same thing happening on the wealthy white side of town to any family and having nobody be held accountable for it. You just can't picture it because it just wouldn't happen, right? And so, um, and so the notion, so back to the original question, right? The notion that BLM um, is sort of atomized such that it can be kind of like political tofu for whoever wants it. Um, yeah, I think it's problematic. Uh, because as I, as, I made in, as I made the case in my, in, my, in my statement, I don't think that the statement, I can't see how the statement could plausibly be objectionable in and of itself. But when it is associated with anarchists who are, you know, throwing rocks or whatever for their own purposes, either for the thrill of the fight or because, um, you know, they take it to a meeting that is beyond, beyond stream. Yeah, I think it undermines the whole cause. That's just me. Thank you. I'm going to combine two questions again, if I can. Um, question asks, you discussed the importance of inviting debate rather than shutting it down as an important foundation of democracy. The questioner was wondering, could you speak to situations where a rational debate is no longer possible because an individual or group holds intolerant views and is unwilling to see perspectives other than their own? The parallel question asks, in order for Americans to find commonality, how can we combat the moral absolutism or moral superiority suggested by those who mislabel others as racists who don't fully support their views? So questions about tolerance, civil debate. Yeah, this is a difficult question. Um, for two reasons. The first is people that are intent on not listening or learning are by definition, <laughs> are people to engage, right? Um, I maintain the proposition based on my faith in humanity and my lived experience that the people who truly fall in that category are a comparatively small number on the spectrum. And the, the, the more correct position is to presume that given the right set of debates, experiences, circumstances over time, that painfully, fitfully, we can all learn from each other and grow from each other. Let me give you two examples um, from my own life recently. Um, both in which I think, I hope I changed someone else's mind and one in which sort of, you know, my mind was enlightened and changed, grown. Um, so I'm the vice chancellor of the University of the South, which is the only university in the history of the United States of America that was purposefully created for the purpose of advancing the superiority of a slaveholding culture. And I'm African-American. That's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> 160 years later, that is not an insignificant thing. Um, and yet, um, a month into my job, I had a call from an alumnus who graduated in the 1970s, who 
called to ask me, Vice Chancellor, I just want to make sure that you're going to let all views be heard on things. I was like, what do you mean? So he said, you know, like on this race thing, like especially like on slavery, you know, and he said, these are direct quotes. Of course, everybody knows that slavery was bad, but not all slaves are treated badly. And, you know, slavery was a necessary evil. I corrected him. I said, well, it was evil, but it wasn't necessary. Uh, and they said, well, you know, it was a business decision. And in business, you have to make hard decisions. So after I caught my breath, um, I assured him that, yes, we would continue to have reason debate on all matters and let the facts lead where they may. Because views like that need in 2020 need to have the light of day so that we can affirmatively debate them, turn them over and see what we think. Now, I will also confess that um, coming to be the, the first vice chance, first African-American vice chancellor of the University of the South uh, in what turned out to be a summer of almost unprecedented racial reckoning um, caused me some level of concern, <laughs> particularly as uh, the Board of Regents of our university put out a very bold statement on September 8th, categorically refuti uh, uh, repudiating our university's past association with the Confederacy and, and the ideology of white supremacy that underlay it. And so we put this statement out, we're at battle stations, right? Ready for another Charlottesville, ready for things to come out. And it was like cricket applause, like, you know, Great, lots of people were like, awesome. And I was puzzled by this. And so I, you know, and so I, I talked to some of our students. I was like, what gives? You know, our, our board put this statement out. We were waiting for it and then kind of crickets. And we thought there'd be massive conversations all around campus. And they said, well, you know, Dr. Brigitte, we're kind of like over it. <laughs> you know, we actually thought the university kind of did this like years ago. We're kind of surprised that they had. Um, and, you know, it's great. Like, so when am I? Like when's the party on Friday, right? Whatever. <laughs> so, um, and 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 by that, you know, I, I I learned something from from all of that, and that is that for all of these debates that we're kind of seeing, you know, around the country, a lot of young people, a lot of folks are actually, you know, much further along on this than many of us kind of had assumed or feared. And so, but the thing is, like, we all got to speak up, right? Because we are in a really perilous moment on these issues. And there's a lot of work to be done, clearly, as this case I laid out to be made. So long way of saying, um, there are some people that refuse to be convinced, uh, like all along the spectrum. And what you have to do is to continue to work, engage those people um, that probably could be, maybe even sort of be a little hesitant, but you continue to talk to you and also make yourself open for learning from perspectives that you might not have before. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna to try to combine another couple of questions again, just to, to keep us moving along. But first I wanna shift gears just a bit. We've been focusing on the United States almost exclusively. A question now about the international moment. Um, how does the Black Lives Matter movement affect American soft power? Uh, given that there was tremendous solidarity internationally with recent protests, can BLM fill in for the current American soft power vacuum at the level of our government's leadership? Yeah, here's the thing. Um, when there are Black Lives Matter murals being painted in Idlib, Syria, <laughs> where they've got a thing or two going on, we need to pay attention, right? I mean, the the, this is not helpful for us. The, the intrinsic, as Joseph Nye wrote, right? I mean, soft power is not, this is actually very important to understand the distinction. Soft power is not like anything that is not guns and bullets. Soft power is the attractive power, the ability to persuade other people to want to be like you and therefore to take the steps that are necessary to emulate what you already have which presumably in that emulation also serves your own interests, right? Because it supports similar values. Um, and the fact that we still 
have this really challenging problem is not helpful for our efforts to attract and encourage other people, other countries to um, emulate our approach. Now, having said that, let me kind of add a couple of caveats. The first is, this is not the first time this has happened. The Soviets absolutely used propaganda against the United States uh, based on um, uh, continued segregation uh, in the Jim Crow South saying like, you know, all this stuff about like, you know, America landed free home in the brave democracy. Yeah, as long as you're white, but all you dark skinned people don't, don't think this applies to you. Here's the film. And so when we were trying to actually make the case um, in across Africa, Latin America, South Asia, um, about why to follow us as opposed to follow communist bloc, this kind of propaganda, propagandistic things are hard. And by the way, that still happens whether it be as we're competing with China for influence across Africa, or we're trying to um, uh, push back against um, right-wing totalitarianism uh, that is resurgent in Eastern Europe, for example, Hungary and other places. That's the first thing. The second is that even if there are aspects in which our government may not be as proactive on these matters as certainly I would like for them to be, the fact that there is substantial social movements in the United States by everyday people um, from big cities like Atlanta and Chicago to you know, tiny Midwestern towns and mountain towns um, where there's barely a black person there, um, but they're standing up for, for basic human dignity. That's powerful. Not unlike in the 1980s when the Reagan government initially opposed uh, the ANC and their quest for multi-party democracy in the end of apartheid in South Africa on the basis that it was communist. Um, and yet much of American civil society continued to engage um, with the ANC and to put pressure on, uh, on the apartheid government such that both the American government eventually came around uh, and, uh, and apartheid fell in South Africa. So this is... Um, and so, and the final thing I would say is, anytime you get something wrong is an opportunity to show how you can get, how you can make it right. And oftentimes making something right when there is an obvious wrong um, is, is better than having been perfect in the first place because it shows your ability to learn. It shows a level of humility. And it also shows you the tools that are necessary of how to, how to create something that has gone you know, grievously wrong which is why I say this is actually a very important moment for us in our collective history. And I hope that we can take advantage of it. Okay, coming back into the United States, two questions uh, related. One asks if you could propose congressional action. Um, ideally, we could turn to Congress for this. Uh, what would you propose as actionable policy proposals to address the racial problems you've outlined? Uh, if there were a law that could fix this, what would it entail? The follow-up question is, Another, uh, another questioner. Um, therefore, do you think a movement towards some sort of some form of rep reparations for Black Americans would begin to heal some of the uh, racial divisions in our country? So, what form should such reparations? Sure. Be? Let me to do? sure. Let me address the reparations questions first, because I think that reparations are simultaneously too hard and too easy. It's too hard because how do you possibly determine? what the net present value is for 400 years of, of free labor and 100 years of apartheid and lost, um, um, lost economic opportunity due to, due to specific uh, policies of the state compounded over centuries and then identified who the appropriate recipient should be. I have no idea how you do that. However, that's the hard part, right? Even if you could do that, it is then far too easy, right? Here's your check, basta, halas, we're done, right? We're no longer talking about institutional racism. We're no longer talking about inequities in the justice system. You can forget talking about the disparate economic, uh, um, educational outcomes. You got your check, 40 acres and a mule. Sorry, it was a couple of centuries too late, but we're done. See ya. Which then leads back to the first question. <laughs> which is what are some public policy approaches um, that we could take to address this? 
There were a few. And the thing is, I mean, this is not rocket science, right? I mean, some of this stuff has already been sort of discussed. It's a question of continue to focus on it and, and continue to address it. But let me start from the premise that we have to accept that this is still a problem. This work is not finished. Let me kind of give you just kind of very basic stat. I was born in 1973, which means that notwithstanding the 400 plus years that black people have been in the United States of America, I belong to the very first generation of African-Americans who were born fully free and equal under the law to all their fellow citizens. My parents weren't. Even people that were born just five years before me in the late 1960s cannot claim that to be the case due to residual laws in the books banning, for example, interracial marriage or, or um, de facto segregation in education, all kinds of other sorts of things. And so we are really only one generation fully free. And we're still here, right? It's not like we passed on yet. <laughs> Touch wood. So, um, so, the, so the reason I say all that is that we have to be frank and honest with ourselves that this, not only does this issue set still persists, but this is the very first generation in which we could have a conversation about it as equals, as full equals from jump, which then leads to the next set of propositions. Secondly, um, let's also recognize that notwithstanding the continued and persistent issues facing Black America, that many of these issues also continue to face large aspects of the rest of America too. As we see increasing poverty concentrated uh, in rural Appalachia or in the, the, the Rust Belt Midwest or, or other places. Last year, life expectancy for white Americans fell for the first time in American history. Even as they continue to both be a gap between white Americans and then certainly African Americans, Latino Americans, and, and those life expectancies continue to creep up. And they're largely from deaths of despair. Things like drug overdoses, um, alcoholism, car, car crashes, DUIs, et cetera, because they are being trapped in cycles of poverty and despair and because they can no longer see that their lives will be better than their parents. In addition to all of this really profound um, ethnic upheaval and social, social change that's happening. And so it is absolutely appropriate for us to be able to link these two things and to see common cause, which then leads to the kind of the next thing I would say. We absolutely have to focus on education. We absolutely have to focus on healthcare and we absolutely have to focus on, on directing capital to create jobs in places where people live. And that means focusing on tax policy. It means focusing on, on some kind of healthcare regime that which we could all agree on, thank you very much. Um, so that people can actually uh, have well and healthy lives. And it means focusing on our tax code so that we find, find ways to not take away wealth, but to encourage its reinvestment in parts of the country that desperately need it. As opposed to simply saying the market solves everything, cut taxes for everybody, call it a day because it's not working. It is objectively not working. And if you solve those problems for Black America, you will solve those problems for places where white America is really hurting. You'll solve those problems in Native communities and you'll solve those problems in growing Latino communities. And that will help us to build a thriving, growing country for everybody. Um, I'll combine another pair. I think I can. Uh, one asks, it seems as if opponents of BLM believe that the protesters are problematic because America is already great. How can we restore the idea of equality for all to these groups that cannot relate? The second question kind of related, but it's sort of looking at the extremes in the American political debate. Uh, the questioner asks, how can descendants of Confederate Army veterans be welcomed into a movement to make society more just and fair uh, if these descendants feel that their family and ancestors are categorically demonized for all of their involvement as a member of the Confederate Army and so forth? What commonality can be focused upon with this group? So how do we deal with the periphery of the debate today. Sure. Um, so re read the first question just one more time, please. Sure. It seems as if opponents of Black Lives Matter believe that protesters are problematic because America is already great. Yeah. How can we restore the idea of equality for all to these groups that cannot relate? Right, so here's the thing. <sighs> uh, 
America is great because it is good. And being good means to be empathetic to those that are, that are suffering, especially when there are compatriots. And to argue, as I discussed in my, in, my, um, in my talk, you know, the kind of love it or leave it crowd that America, the right or wrong, my country, right or wrong, uh, any criticism is inherently anti, you know, is wrong. I mean, as somebody said, I don't know how to make people can, uh, care about others. Um, but what I do know is that the more you actually are engaging with people who can turn these sufferings into a, actually not simply a, a protest line or a hashtag or a, or a campaign speech, but turn it into help you understand kind of lived experience, the better. Which also goes back to seeing our um, ourselves as common, um, you know, common countrymen. Um, and all I can say is that we have got to figure out, I mean, it, we, we, we have to figure out on a very individual basis, everybody, how are you engaging and talking with people that are not simply reinforcing your own view of the world? Um, I don't know how to do that, but I know that's the path and I'm spending an awful lot of my time, my own writing and others trying try to sort of think about that. With regard to you know, those who have um, Confederate um, ancestors and how do we you know, invite them to be part of a conversation for making, um, advancing equality in the 21st century without calling everybody a racist. Um, this takes a bit of courage and grace by everybody on all sides. Let me explain what I mean. This whole place is steeped <laughs> in, uh, in honoring men who had only built this incredible university, but who are also deeply engaged in the Confederacy. And so we have to figure out, someone like me has to figure out how to have the dexterity of mind to simultaneously honor the good things that they've done that have made our current life possible, even as we are honest and clear about their worldview, not judging them by the circumstances of our time because there's, those views were contested in their day. That's why there was a war. Right? So, um, but nevertheless, if we are going to have a pathway together as a, uh, as a country, those of us whose ancestors were on the wrong side of that, or on the challenging side of the prevailing social norms, have to give space and grace for those that are whose ancestors are on the other side. Now, the flip side to that is that I, I completely understand why this can be very difficult. Almost everybody I meet here on the mountain is fourth, fifth. They can tell you like, you know, what battles their great, great grandfather served in, in the, in the civil war and on the Southern side. And um, um, it's a thing. And so these are very deeply personal stories of heritage, which I get and I understand. But we also have to be brave enough to confront the truth. Chief amongst them was the notion that the war is about anything other than slavery, <laughs> um, which is not factually accurate. Or that the war, well, you know, there's only a few people that own slaves, but you no, know, everyone else didn't, right? After the war, after Appomattox, it is not as if all these Confederates rushed back to their farms to set up multicultural um, church congregations uh, and to figure out how everybody can live together in unity. There was reconstruction was specifically stuck out and was followed by a century of apartheid in the South that could only have endured with the broad political consent of the white population. And that was only overturned finally due to the bravery of many black and some white people in the hits of the civil rights movement. And even only then by those who had exhibited enormous courage in the face of water hoses and dogs and lynchings and castrations. And so 
we collectively have to have grace with each other, but the grace has to start with the truth. Because to deny the truth is to do two things. One, it is to deny the suffering on the other side. And it's also to minimize the courage and the sacrifice of those who had to endure it. So there is a new way of being in our new self, indeed in our country, of finally fully embracing each other as brothers and sisters, of acknowledging fully and freely what was wrong. Yes, our ancestors, but thank God we're all still here. And let us build a future together. We're just about at the time limit, so I have one last question, which I think is a, a nice note that you can finish on. It's um, what is the most important thing for students to take away from college on the issues surrounding Black Lives Matter? If you can be sure that the students of Suwannee or Washington only understood one thing about BLM, what would it be? Empathy. Empathy. Right. Look, forget who you know, whether you're a Trumpster or whether you think that you know or not, right? I mean, forget uh, what the electoral complications are, you know, forget whether everybody's a communist or a fascist or that sort of stuff. The most important thing is to be able to see the humanity in somebody who's different from yourself. That goes for my black brothers and sisters too. And that's the starting point for everything else. Um, I, I have long since come to the conclusion that there are really only two types of people in the world. Those that can see the common humanity and people different from themselves and act accordingly, and those who cannot and do not. And if you can come away with your undergraduate education looking at Black Lives Matter or looking at the pro-life movement or looking about anything else, and you're able to at least empathize with people on the other side, then you're on the right track. Ambassador, on behalf of the entire university community, I just want to say thank you for making our kickoff this year absolutely mem memorable. Thanks to all the folks who were able to uh, join us both by Zoom and on the live stream. I got through as many questions as I could, um, many more. Um, thank you all. Uh, have a good evening. And thank you again, Ambassador. Thank you. Bye-bye.